lifestyle and behavior are important parts of health, both prevention and treatment. You know, everybody knows this. They hear every day that they should eat better, they should exercise, that, you know, they shouldn't stress out and relax, they shouldn't smoke or drink too much. Uh, this is common knowledge. But the question is, how do you actually make it happen in your life so that it's a natural part of your habits? It's not something you're struggling for. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next installment of How Healing Works. I'd like to introduce my guest, Dr. Richard Lee, to the program. Dr. Lee is an oncologist and the medical director of the Integrative Medicine Program at City of Hope in California. As the medical director, he provides comprehensive cancer care using both conventional and complementary treatments, which we'll discuss. We're delighted to have him with us today to discuss a new set of guidelines for healthcare that providers can use on pain management for cancer patients using integrative approaches. These guidelines were released past fall by the Society of Integrative Oncology and the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO and SIO, and they were just published this month in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. They recommend several complementary therapies for cancer and cancer treatment pain. Dr. Lee was a member of the committee to review the health literature, the research literature, and to help develop the guidelines. Welcome, Dr. Lee, and thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, Wayne. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and represent the committee that published the SIO and ASCO pain guidelines on integrative therapies for cancer patients. Well, I... Pain in cancer, both produced by the cancer and also by the treatment, sometimes is a major issue around the country. So these are very, very important guidelines. We always need more in our toolbox and especially uh, drugless approaches if we can uh, because of some of the problems of, that are produced by treating uh, pain with drugs, although we need to combine them both. Before we get into talking about these guidelines and what they add, add I'd, I'd like my listeners to know a little bit about who we're talking about to and, and with and about you. Now, you're a physician, you're an oncologist, you are also then got additional training in integrative oncology. And can you tell us a little bit about how this happened? How did you get into this? Why did you get into being a physician and oncologist? And then finally, why did you begin to look into integrative oncology? Yes, it was uh, a long journey, um, and so I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. I grew up in a small farming town in Illinois. My father was a uh, family practice physician in a town of only 6,000 people. And so that experience really left me with an impression about the important role a physician plays in a community. And I really saw the impact of how a family physician can really help a community and, and and so that uh, experience really made me think about uh, medicine as a career. And he really practiced medicine probably the way it was practiced you know, uh, 50 years ago, plus not, not so much the way we practice it now, where he was really solo practice here at a, a partner and he was really on call all the time. Um, and so I saw it practice in a different way. He would make home calls and, uh, and really be there for his patients. And so that experience was really uh, a guiding light for me in terms of what I wanted to do. Then after deciding going to medicine, uh, as I was uh, completing my uh, residency at Stanford, um, I had an opportunity to take time off because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to focus on. I know I wanted to proceed in a, in a fellowship. And so um, I actually had a, a year off. I decided to go pursue oncology just because of the the science, and I really felt like it was a field that made a major difference in, in patients' lives. Uh, and that with that time off, I always wanted to do something different. My family is from Taiwan, and my father had spent a little bit of time learning acupuncture, and so that had always uh, intrigued me. And so with this time off, I, I decided to uh, take that year to go abroad, and I was fortunate enough to get a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, and so I was in Taiwan, a little bit in China, 
with a focus of learning traditional Chinese medicine and really uh, honing in on acupuncture as a modality. So that experience really opened my eyes to the idea that there's something else out there beyond what I was learning in a traditional Western medical school. And where I learned acupuncture was at China Medical University in, in Taichung, Taiwan. And what's really unique about Taiwan is that they offer, they have a national healthcare system that offers both Western medicine and traditional Chinese medicine. And you can choose or you can do both. And the university I was at actually does both. And so medical students earn a degree in Chinese medicine and Western medicine at the same time. And so for me, learning and training there was really eye-opening to see how the two sides worked hand in hand together uh, to help patients. And so although I hadn't planned on it, that experience made me really think about what I wanted to do within the field of cancer medicine and, and thought I should really take back what I learned and think about how do we bring that uh, for cancer care. And, and so uh, during my fellowship at the New Chicago, uh, I, I started to pursue this as an area of study and research. And then I found that many of the integrative therapies are really focused on quality of life and symptom management. So I pursued a fellowship in uh, palliative care at Northwestern. Uh, and, and so that really helped hone my skills in terms of thinking about the impact these types of therapies can have for cancer patients. And then from there, I was really fortunate to uh, go to MD Anderson uh, and became the medical director for the Integrative Medicine Center. And that really helped, again, kind of solidify my career, my, my trajectory. Uh, and, and now, um, now I've, I've come full circle here to City of Hope to help build them uh, an integrative oncology program for the entire enterprise. Wow, what a journey. That is a long journey. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, so you started off seeing what whole person care was like with your father. I mean, he had to take care of the whole person, social and emotional, as well as the medical issues in, in, in a community in that setting. That's family medicine, right? Uh, in those communities. And then your eyes were opened up to other healing traditions uh, that are outside of what we do in the West and realize there's some value in that and spent a whole year uh, at that, uh, but all grounded in high quality science and good conventional care in those areas. So so is that what integrative oncology is? It's sort of the merger of uh, evidence-based approaches from both conventional, some from traditional and complementary approaches that, that are uh, brought to the table for uh, optimizing the patient care. Is that is that it? Absolutely, that's right on target. It's really, really bringing these two worlds together of the modern medicine and, and all the, the great benefits there, but it doesn't have all the answers and really saying that we should keep their door open to traditional medicines, complementary therapies. And I think what really differentiates integrative oncology from say more alternative or complementary approaches is the fact that it's really grounded in evidence-based medicine. So really looking at the clinical research that exists to help inform us about the the benefits and the potential harms and understanding how do we deliberately bring these two sides together in a way that has some synergy and provides even better optimal care for the for the patient. Yeah. Yeah. So that science-based approach is something that we bring to it in the West to help sort out what works, what doesn't work, uh, why, and that type of thing, which is great. I mean, that's essential and one of the great contributions that we have in the West. I know that this is sort of what this is what the guidelines have done, haven't they? I mean, ASCO has a long tradition of producing good evidence-based guidelines. SIO has been doing that too, but it's a younger organization, and they did this one together, didn't they? Uh, jointly to to do that, and uh, really took a hard look of uh, what does the research say, how good is it in those areas? Can you tell us a little bit about what they found? I know. ESCO had some guidelines on pain, but this one broadened that. Uh, again, used the same rigorous methodology to take a look at the evidence. Uh, what did they find? What did they say? Can you give us a snapshot? Yes, yes. So absolutely, the, the Society for Integrative Oncology, along with American Society, Society for Clinical Oncology, uh, came together and, and really helps uh, work in a synergistic fashion to create these new guidelines focused on integrative therapies uh, for cancer pain, which ha would hadn't been done yet. And so, um, you know, on behalf of the committee uh, led by June Mao and uh, Eduardo Brera and others, 
Um, we spent many, many months looking at all the data, really looking for high quality research, clinical trials that were randomized addressing this question. And we looked at many different symptoms. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so some of the key findings were that there are as moderate level evidence uh, and moderate strength recommendations that acupuncture can be helpful for aromatase induced arthralgias, which uh, aromatase inhibitors are used commonly for breast cancer patients as after they finish uh, surgery and chemotherapy and radiation. There's also a moderate level evidence to recommend the use of acupuncture, reflexology or acupressure and massage for musculoskeletal pain or cancer-related pain. Well, we also found that for patients undergoing a procedure that's associated with pain, such as a biopsy, hypnosis can be another uh, important tool in which to manage pain uh, during that uh, uh, procedure that many patients have to undergo. And then lastly, in the area of pain during palliative care, a massage therapy was also found to have good evidence uh, that it can reduce uh, significant uh, pain symptoms for our patients. Yeah. So that's that's really a, a wonderful list of drugless approaches, uh, which I know people are more and more interested in nowadays. Uh, and so they were all pretty safe in, in these areas. Uh, I didn't know for sure if they all worked or not, but uh, something that I think a lot of patients would be very interested in doing, a lot of oncologists would say, let me see if I can make them available. Um, uh, how does that happen? I know you're a practicing oncologist. You do some of these things in a conventional practice setting. Uh, how do patients get these? So what are some of the challenges that they have and, and what do they need to do in order to try to make these kinds of things available? For, their, for the treatment of their pain. Right. So there are some uh, potential uh, challenges that occur when thinking about how to bring about some of these therapies like acupuncture and massage as part of their overall uh, care plan. Uh, one is, you know, finding the availability of a practitioner and preferably having a practitioner that is uh, has experience or training in working with cancer patients so that the acupuncture or massage therapy can be modified appropriately uh, for safety issue. Uh, and, and then preferably you want to find a practitioner that is in communication with your oncology team, your cancer team. So you want there to be um, information being shared in both directions in, in terms of your, your overall care plan. So are you undergoing radiation or do you just have surgery a few weeks ago? You know, there might be areas you might want to avoid for the procedure. Uh, and then another common uh, challenge that patients may run into is really thinking about um, if they're able to find a practitioner, is it covered by insurance? Yeah. Now, um, where I was at previously in Cleveland, Ohio, oftentimes insurance cover, didn't cover it except for limited indications. What I found here, at, say, on the West Coast in California is that insurance companies seem a little bit more forward thinking and that there are several insurance companies that are covering things like acupuncture uh, for certain indications such as you know low back pain or arthritis and, and other conditions. So. I think depending where you are, you may find different levels of coverage. Uh, and then if there isn't, uh, potentially are there cancer centers that are offering it potentially at a, at a lower rate or may have a sliding scale so that you're still able to access it. Uh, for things like acupuncture, people are, are looking at new models of delivery, such as group acupuncture, so that you really don't have to pay the full price, but you're, you're with five or six other individuals and it may um, be more convenient and practical uh, in that sense. So, so those are some of the the key things to think about and, and, and challenges that patients may, um, you know, run into as they think about some of these treatments uh, as they undergo cancer care. So if an oncologist that doesn't normally know about these things and deliver them, I mean, I wasn't trained in these things in, in medical school, and I don't think they still do it in most medical schools, but they want to do this. They want to open up a new more whole person or integrative care to, to try to implement these guidelines. Are there some gaps or some areas that uh, or places they can go to get educated in these areas, or do we need to do more of that? Well, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, there's always a, um, a need for more education around integrative therapies, both for uh, oncology providers, clinicians, whether the physicians or nurse practitioners or nurses, as well as for patients, to, to let them know that there is a growing evidence uh, through clinical research that these uh, therapies can wreak a real impact and that we don't always have to rely on a prescription medicine to address uh, symptoms such as pain. Uh, and so, you know, uh, areas, you know, the American Society for Clinical Oncology, ASCO, ASCO.org, uh, 
for the Society for Integrative Oncology, uh, integrativeonc.org as well, uh, have very good websites with information and, and provide access to these uh, guidelines. Um, and there's also uh, the NCI National Cancer Institute, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, MD Anderson have very good informative websites that can provide further education and understanding about the different therapies that exist and, and the evidence that uh, is currently present. That's great. We'll try to make those uh, websites available to our listeners here so that they can access and take a look at that. So uh, if, if I'm a cancer patient uh, and I hear about this or I just go online and start looking around, and uh, I mean, it's sort of a wild west out there and uh, uh, you can get all kinds of things. It's hard to distinguish sometimes uh, what's legitimate, what's not. These guidelines really help do that. So if they actually you know, we'll look at that. Uh, if they see those guidelines and say, gee, I would like to make uh, some of that care available in my own cancer care, uh, is how to, should they take these guidelines to their to their oncologist or the oncology team? Should they point them out? Should they, how do they approach and discuss this with their oncologist and the, and the cancer care team? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, any patients that is interested in, in incorporating these types of therapies I think a good start is to uh, begin a conversation with your cancer team, whether it be the nurse or the physician, uh, to say you know you you recently were aware of some evidence-based guidelines, um, and then you may want to bring a copy of the article, uh, and uh, let them know that the SIO and ASCO have put out these joint guidelines. Uh, both of them have a sh strong reputation for being evidence-based and providing uh, guidelines that are reliable and based on good data. And so I think most oncologists would see this and understand that if those organizations have put out a joint guideline that uh, these are guidelines that are, are are can be relied on and, and are, are come from a good base of evidence and to something to, to think about. And so that I think is really the key is starting a discussion and then learning about what their experience is. And if maybe they worked with a massage therapist or a acupuncturist or, or others, um, and so they might already have some contacts in the local community. Uh, and if not, you, you may want to explore and think about, uh, are there cancer centers uh, in the area that might have an integrative medicine program or even an integrative oncology program in particular uh, that might be providing services in your area? That's great. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, there are some patient summaries uh, built into these guidelines. So if patients want to would do that, they don't have to be too intimidated by going to the sites and finding that um, uh, because there are places where they have summarized in lay language for patients and provided uh, information on how to, to access that. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. That's correct. That's a good point. Great. Thank you. Uh, so let me ask you a couple other questions about the evidence levels in here. It's, it's a bit of a challenge to get evidence in these areas, and there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, many of them are behavioral, uh, meaning they require pretty complex behavior, uh, uh, massage, uh, yoga, is educational thing you practice on your own, hypnosis, uh, you know, is set in some ways like psychotherapy, music therapy. They're not a, a simple approach like a new drug that you can stick in and you can do a placebo and and say, oh, well, let's see if it's the drug or the placebo. It's hard to actually create controls in these areas. So that's one of the areas. How did the committee sort of sort through that uh, to try to determine, you know, where does, how, how do you determine what's good evidence in these areas when you actually can't create um, placebo <clears throat> controls and it involves an educational component? Right. Yeah. You're, you're exactly right in the sense that integrative therapy clinical trials are more challenging to conduct than, say, your standard uh, medicine, where you can take a placebo pill versus the real pill, the real uh, medicine, and they look very similar. <clears throat> In this case, it's, it's you know more challenging to have a placebo yoga uh, intervention <laughs> and a real yoga. Um, you know, the field is evolving and improving. And so there are um, growing ways we understand of how to conduct high-quality randomized controlled trials. And oftentimes the control arm is a, what we might call an attention control. So um, there is a behavioral intervention, but it's really minimized uh, and does not replicate exactly what yoga or hypnosis or massage uh, would provide. And so 
as we learn uh, better how to conduct these clinical trials so that we do have a, an appropriate control arm, uh, again, it might be a wait list control where individuals are just waiting to receive the intervention versus a, a true kind of uh, sham control. Sometimes we can do sham acupuncture. Some of these studies uh, utilize that type of control. And that's what we're really looking for um, is looking at these uh, well-designed randomized controlled trials with you know adequate numbers to be able to uh, provide the statistical power to really detect a difference. Uh, is the modality really providing a specific benefit or is the benefit potentially more more generalized and maybe not specific to that therapy? Um, so, but we are finding that there is growing clinical trials like in hypnosis, very large phase three randomized trials, uh, acupuncture starting more clinical trials in yoga. Uh, and so the, the researchers out there are really getting better and more sophisticated in their designs to really help us answer the question is, you know, are these therapies effective um, for s symptoms such as pain. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, you know, trying to distinguish these things often from placebo is a challenge because uh, we know that placebo involves uh, a lot of benefit. Uh, it's one of the, the challenges in separating it, especially because it's behavioral, right? I mean, belief, expectation, the ritual of care can sometimes produce significant benefit, and these might have a little higher ritual level than, uh, than uh, you know, some of it the drug treatments uh, in those areas. Um, uh, it seems to me that for many oncologists and patients, but also, you know, oncologists that are trying to just decide, should I make this available or not? What they really want to know, is it worth doing compared to just not doing it, just uh, doing what I, you know, do usual care. And are there studies that do that kind of comparison where they just say standard care with and without uh, some of these kinds of approaches? Oh, yes, yes. And that's uh, this kind of comparative effectiveness studies uh, is also growing in popularity where the comparison arm is more of a usual care. Uh, and so you have usual care versus usual care plus, in some cases, acupuncture, massage. And so I think those studies are also helpful. The, the usual care uh, is, um, is a considered a, a reasonable control arm. And these comparative effectiveness studies, oftentimes now the Comparative arm is really standard of care, and so there might be a standard of care medicine uh, that's utilized to see is the integrative therapy as good or if not better uh, than what we commonly use, say, for chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, for which there are limited options. Yeah, so this isn't too unlike in conventional care. There are uh, uh, ritualistic or uh, complex treatments that you can't really create a sham for surgery, for example. Uh, and so the studies use the same kind of approach of comparative effectiveness research, where they're just comparing it to getting it or not getting it, or comparing it to medical versus surgical or something like that. So it seems like that approach would be more appropriate to these kinds of uh, if the decision is uh, just to try to make it available and not dig down into the underlying mechanisms uh, of that. Now, I noticed in the guidelines vast majority of them were very safe. And the committee said, well, the, the benefit, the, the, the harm is very low. Uh, and so it's very unlikely that you're going to get um, a, a, a negative be a benefit to effectiveness uh, or harm to, to benefit ratio, which, you, you know, everybody wants to, of course, know is it, you know, you're going to get more harm versus good out of it. Uh, and, and yet many of these practices also uh, don't have a lot of economic engine behind them. There's not large companies that are going to make a big profit off of delivering, you know, you know, hypnosis or, or a, a massage or something like that. Uh, and, and so uh, getting the, the size of the studies, you mentioned that there's some phase three studies, large studies going on now around acupuncture and hypnosis. Good to hear that. But those are often slow in coming, aren't there? Because there's not folks that are that are funding that. Um, uh, you know, uh, shouldn't we be screening these for safety and benefit, and then uh, uh, you know making them available at the discretion of the clinic or the hospital or the, or the insurance company if they're safe and might show some benefit as those larger studies are done compared to something that. It might actually harm you. Where you really know need to know that up front. Is that a strategy that the uh, that the committee maybe considered in terms of future um, uh, guidelines in these areas? 
Right. I, I think that's a good question. I, I think there's a kind of debate on both sides about what is the best strategy moving forward, especially when the relatively harm is on the low side, especially with something like hypnosis, um, where uh, you know, you're not looking at a lot of potential side effects. Uh, I do think that uh, as we look uh, at the potential harms, uh, we are expanding our view in terms of what, what does that mean? And so, uh, for instance, if uh, patients are pursuing acupuncture and they have to pay out of pocket, for which there may not be great evidence, there could be a financial toxicity. Uh, and some of these programs um, do take a significant amount of time and energy uh, to pursue. So acupuncture oftentimes is done two or three times a week. And uh, things like uh, mind-body programs, which exist, uh, such as my, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which if you look at the, you know, the whole program, it, it takes uh, over 20, 25 hours or six to eight weeks, which a newly diagnosed cancer patient may have limited time and energy. And so I think the question is, do they want to pursue that um, if they're involved in surgery and chemotherapy uh, versus maybe, you know, what's the timing of that intervention? Uh, and what would be more appropriate? Uh, and then do they spend their time and energy and potential finances on other therapies that might have more efficacy uh, behind them if they're trying to manage pain? So I think for every patient, that's um, it's a different uh, calculus in terms of what makes the most sense uh, for those in survivorship versus those in middle of treatment. We may have we may want to think about different approaches uh, for those individuals and what might be best for them. But I, I agree that with interventions that have low uh, potential for harm and and have a reasonable uh, you know chance for increasing uh, benefit and quality of life, that it'd be reasonable you know to consider. And we do have in the guidelines um, we do include recommendations for things like guided imagery, uh, acupuncture. Uh, music therapy for which there are weaker levels of evidence, but we did feel that you know the harm is is relatively low and the benefit it, it might be there, and so it'd be something to consider, especially if they maybe have already tried other standard of care approaches. Now you make a great point. Some of these some of these types of approaches, even though safe, uh, are quite uh, are are quite complex to deliver. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you very much for being so straightforward, comprehensive, uh, and for all the work that you're doing in this area. I think this is uh, this is an important area, very beneficial. Is there anything you would like to, our listeners to know about uh, uh, to uh, find out more about this, and, uh, access them, or anything else you'd like to say? Well, I want to say thank you again, Wayne, for inviting me and speaking on behalf of the committee. Uh, it was a very large undertaking. I, I, I having this is my first time really doing a rigorous evidence-based review uh, of of uh, integrative therapies for pain and, and other symptoms. It's the amount of hours and effort it was really took a, a whole village, uh, and so appreciative of the entire committee, the Samueli Foundation, uh, and and the committee chairs of uh, June Bow and Eduardo Barrera. Um, you know, I hope it really encourages both clinicians, uh, cancer clinicians, as patients to really think outside the box. Uh, like you mentioned earlier on, you know, we don't always have to depend on a prescription. There are effective treatments out there to help patients manage their pain and potentially use less medications, so, which often come with more side effects. So uh, I think these are great guidelines. And I'm looking forward to seeing the upcoming guidelines uh, kind of coming out in the, in the near future. Well, thank you very much. This is an important step towards going in the direction of care of the future for cancer patients, and you have it now. And that's care of the whole person. And uh, let's hope that becomes a standard part of care. And you've contributed a lot to that. So thank you very much and look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you, Wade. Appreciate it.